Please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 10. Some of you are visiting with us, Calvary Chapel. We just go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, straight through the Bible. So you've shown up on the day that we are halfway through John 10. So the intent, Lord willing, is to, to finish chapter. The chapter begins with all of the uh, symbolic illustration that Jesus gives as far as being the good shepherd. He explains everything about that, what it means, why that pertains to him, what it is that, that he came here to do, what he continues to do for us. Since so we've already looked into that, and now we're moving on. We're going to be in verse 22. This is about two months later uh, from the previous verse, everything that we talked about last week at the Feast of Dedication. So uh, verse 22, now it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's horse. Now, you may not be familiar with the Feast of Dedication. You probably are familiar with the, the term Hanukkah or the Festival of Lights. Same thing. It started off being called the the Feast of Dedication. Um, this is to um, commemorate a time when they went in and rededicated the temple because there was a, a uh, not too great a guy, a ruler there, who went in and, and demanded to be worshipped in the, in the temple himself. He took away the worship of God. He instituted uh, idolatry there and, and uh, just kind of abstained everything about the place, the building and all the utensils and everything. He took it for his worship of idols. And there was this revolt from, um, uh, from a group of Jewish freedom fighters rose up and they defied the oppressive pagan regime and, and they overtook this guy. And, and so then the temple was rededicated to God and they, they came in and they had this big festival. And there's a, there was a story in there about how the only thing they could find in the, in the temple that hadn't been um, tainted by the, the pagan worship there was this one vessel of, of olive oil. And so for, uh, for their worship, they needed, needed lights to be lit by, by oil. But there was only enough there for the day. And, and they, they, it was going to be eight days before they could make new oil to, to finish uh, restoring the, uh, the storehouse there and keep things going. Uh, and so the, the miracle of God was when they came with pure hearts des de desiring to rededicate the temple, that one day's worth of olive oil lasted for eight days. So that's why there's eight candles uh, for Hanukkah. That's why it's the, 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 uh, the Festival of Lights. That's what that's about. So this is the, the time where Jesus goes in to the temple there. Now this is interesting to me, the fact that it's the feast to commemorate the rededication of the temple from having been profaned by idol worship. The fact that in some ways, idol worship has returned to the temple in a way, right? All the things that we've been looking at, the things that the religious leaders were being governed by as they're, they're uh, instituting their form of worship there, which as we, the more we look into it, it just seems more fleshly driven. There's not a lot of God in what's going on there. And so the fact that in some ways this idol worship has returned in the religious leaders of the day, they're being led by their, their emotions, they're being led by their intellect, they're, they're being led by their fleshly desires instead of being led by God. I don't, I don't know if this sticks out to you, but we, we see all of these instances where Jesus is going against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these religious leaders and and there's all this conflict between them and, and Jesus will use scripture and he will explain things. He'll explain why he is who he is and why they should accept that. And, and their retort is just always, well, you're of the devil. I, I don't know you. I don't know what to tell you. You're of the devil. Uh, but you know what they never do? They never go pray. You notice that? There's never a time of, of fasting and prayer to determine uh, what to do about Jesus. It's just, hey, he's inciting the people to riot against us. We should kill him. And so that's why I say this is kind of like idolatry back in the temple again. It's very self-centered. Uh, uh, were they setting up uh, little idols of other gods? No, but they were setting themselves up as, as their own idols uh, in the way I look at it. So that's going on. Uh, uh, they're trying to, uh, to, to uh, shout Jesus down instead of going about it in a godly way. The fact that Jesus himself is now the necessary revolt leading to rededication. All of this just points me to the, to the fact that it's no coincidence that this happens during the Feast of uh, uh, Dedication. I love it. So, picking it up there again in verse 22, and we'll keep going this time. Now, it was the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus, I don't know where they've been. Uh, 
Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Straight from Jesus. I already told you who I am, Jesus says. They're like, hey, just tell us. Hey, quit messing around. Tell us who you are. He said, I told you. Back in chapter 6, he probably didn't say back in chapter 6, but... But back in what will eventually be chapter 6, I said, in verse 35, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He keeps telling them who sent him, right? He's trying to, to explain it to him. In, in chapter 8, verse 42. Then Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. In verse, four, in verse 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. It doesn't get any more blatant than that. Before Abraham was, I am. In uh, chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, talking about the blind man he had healed. When he had found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him, or see, Jesus is talking to the blind man, but the Pharisees are there. They're hearing this whole conversation where he said, I am he. I am the one. I already told you who I am. I already showed you who I am. Miracles of provision. I'm sure the story has gone all throughout the land. The crowd of 5,000 men plus their wives and children fed with five loaves and two fish. Miracles of healing up to and including the blind man. That was just two months ago. The scriptures you hold dear pass down through those you claim as your heritage. Moses and Abraham show you who I am. Tell us plainly, they said, I told you. My miracles have shown you. The scriptures bear witness of me. It's not that I haven't told you. We don't have, I don't have a communication problem, Jesus would say. I've been pretty bold, and I've been getting more and more bold with each passing day. Verse 24, back in our text. How long do you keep us in doubt? Jesus says, here's why you're in doubt. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. You're in doubt because you're not my fish. Fish, you're not my sheep. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I was back on the fishes and loaves. Sorry. We can edit that out of the video, right? That's not going to be there, right? <laughs> we'll leave the laughter. I'll just put in a really smart joke, and then we'll... <laughs> my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and I know them, and they follow me. That's the problem. That's why you don't understand that I've already explained that to you. I would say the same holds true for the world today. For the misdirection of the culture today. For the misdirection of parts of the organized church today. 
for the taking in of, of false teaching and false gospels and false prophecies today. I think Jesus would look at a lot of people today and say, but you do not believe because you were not of my sheep, as I said to you. Putting on Christ, as the scriptures tell us, is the privilege of the regenerated life in those being saved. We can put on Christ like, like putting on a garment that covers us. And when the Father looks at us, that's what he sees. Paul talks about putting on Christ. It's much more than putting a cross on a building and calling it church. It's a lot more than fish bumper stickers on your car. It's much more than having your name on a church roll or in a church directory or on the list of people who are serving in the church even. Putting on Christ means that He is your shepherd. In accordance with the fullness of that illustration, you go back to the beginning of this chapter. Putting on Christ means He is your shepherd by your choice. It means that you have learned to distinguish his voice from the crowd. That you know that your life depends on following that voice no matter what. That's a high bar. A lot of us feel like we're struggling to, to get to that point. You know, how beautiful the illustration is of all the sheep in the sheepfold, all the different flocks together overnight. And when, they're, when that, that part of the flock, when their shepherd shows up in the morning and calls out to them, just they leave. The rest of the sheep stay there because they're waiting for their shepherd. How beautiful that is. How beautiful it would be if we could get to that point where every time we hear our shepherd's voice, we immediately can distinguish it from everything else so that we can immediately choose to follow him. It is a high bar. Much more high than most people seem to be interested in reaching for. Just to be honest. High enough that it must be aimed for. It must be gone after on purpose. High enough that it's hard, that it's hard work to get at it. But that's okay. Because the one who's holding the bar steady, not moving it around, not raising it higher and lower, says this, and Matthew, come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Doesn't matter that it's hard work. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hard work, yes, but it's easy. And it's not burdensome. Most of you have heard my testimony on that when I called my pastor friend over at Calvary Brentwood. Rob, such a sweet guy, he's so encouraging. And I was having a tough day. I was having a tough month. And so I called Rob, and I'm like, I'm, I'm wanting to have a little pity party and get a little support, you know, just a little, just a little you know, because Dana wasn't having it. <laughs> so I called Rob. He's like, hey, how you doing, Brother Kent? How are things in Murfreesboro? Oh, Rob, it's, it's tough, man. I've been working so much, and there's so much going on, and this and that and that and the other, and I just go on and on and on and on and on. And at the end, there's this pause, and he says, I'm waiting for, oh, my brother, it's going to be all right. Let me pray for you right now. That's what I wanted. What I got was, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so what, what do you mean I'm doing it wrong? He said, Jesus said, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If his work is too hard for you, you're doing it wrong. And he was right. He was exactly right. The same shepherd who has set up that system. Hard work, but not burdensome. Hard work, but easy. Says this. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. A high bar? Sure. A difficult road? You better believe it. Too much for you to attain to? Never. 
Never. Because it is the creator of the universe who lifts you up to the bar and sustains you there, if that's where you want to be. Come to him. Take his yoke. And you'll find it easy and peaceful. Is, it, is this stringent standard too hard to maintain? To use the lyrics from the old DC talk song, what if I stumble? What, what if I fall? <laughs> what if I lose my step and make fools of us all, they said. I love that song. But what if I strain against his yoke? Sometimes pulling my own way. What, what if I can't maintain eye contact with him? I start sinking like Peter did. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. There's your truth for today. If you are His, you are His. Rest in the comfort of uh, of understanding what, what He expects from you, which is just to surrender to Him. Understand that that's the easiest path. I don't care how it looks. I don't care how it feels. That is the easiest path. And then just get on it and rest. One of my favorite passages ever. Go with me to Romans for a minute. Romans chapter 8. I dearly love this. We call it blessed assurance. Paul describes it like this in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. High bar? Yeah. Difficult road? Yes. Too much for you? No. What if I stumble? He's there to lift you up. The same way you do when you're a little toddler, you're trying to teach to walk when they fall. What do you do? You immediately run to them, right? Lift them back up. Try again. Let me reset you. Let me give you your balance again. Now try. How many times are you willing to do that for your little kid? How many times do you think your Heavenly Father is willing to do that for you? How glorious, how marvelous, how invigorating, how inspiring, how reassuring. The wonderful gospel of peace that He can and will save and that nothing can overcome His grip on us and rip us away. That there's salvation, that there's rest, that there's peace, that there's victory. Glorious. See, I hear that, and I'm all stirred up. I can imagine standing there hearing Jesus say, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And I would be like, yes! Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. That was their reaction. We're a little different, me and the Pharisees. That seemed like good news to me. 
And again, they took up stones to stone him. Only his sheep can hear him. And those who can't hear him can't follow him. And those who aren't following him are spurred by the devil to hate him. There's no middle ground between the two positions. There's the evidence. Those who believe and trust and adore follow him. Everybody else hates him. You know, we talk all the time about there's no fence to sit on but between the two positions. Let me go one farther. I was thinking about this this week, that whole fence analogy. I was like, you know what? You go down to the Coe's department, you want to build a fence on your property. They tell you where you're allowed to put it. And where is it? It's a certain distance inside your property line. So there is a fence to sit on. But it's on somebody's property. It's not in between the two. Same thing with Jesus. Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. He said, if you're not gathering with me, you're scattering from me. For or against. 31 again. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Back in verse uh, 24. How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 30. I and my Father are one. Verse 33. If you don't stop answering our questions honestly, we're going to kill you. Thirty-four. Jesus answers them, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, You are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am. In him. Again, we talked about this last week. He's bringing them back to that stumbling stone of their argument, the miracles. You don't think I'm sent from God. What are you going to do with all these miracles? What are you going to do with all of this blessing? What are you going to do with my ability to stand in the temple and speak of the scriptures? And people are like, whoa, something special just happened. Like he knows stuff. What are you going to do with all of that? Why are you still so against me with all of this evidence? Remember the conflict between the two factions of the crowd a couple of months back in last week's teaching. After he brought sight to a blind man since birth. Uh, go back to verse uh, 19. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? There's a point in, in conscious reality, if you're paying attention, where if you keep trying to deny the actuality of Jesus being the Messiah, you have to wrestle with the fact that he, of his supernatural works and his supernatural words and his supernatural love. And you have to attribute those to Satan to stand against him. And that's a problem. There's a point there where your brain just kind of locks up. Like, that doesn't make any sense. There's only two sources of supernatural phenomena from which to choose. So if he's hard to align with the devil, you pretty much have to align him with God, don't you? I love how he's just so patient with them. He must, he must be getting angry or frustrated at least at this point. Tell us plainly who you are. What have we been doing for the last year? But again, he brings them back to the problem with their own argument. He's giving them the chance to reason it out. Okay, if you need reason and logic, you can do it that way too. 
you can't get saved that way, but you can realize who I am that way. Verse 37. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I and him. He's like, hey, believe something. Let's find a starting point for you guys. Believe something. Don't just allow your brain to short circuit and shift into neutral because you don't like the direction the evidence is heading. Find an honest starting point, one that lines up with the evidence you can be sure of and work forward from there. You know those miracles happen. Start there. Let them lead you to me. Why was it so important way back in chapter 1 for John to establish the deity of Christ? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the foundation for everything we need to know about Jesus. And that is the thing that they are fighting against as hard as they can. It's important that, to Jesus that people understand deity. That's why it was important to John. It's important to Jesus. He keeps going back there. Before Abraham was, I am. Same title. Same name. Same God. Why did John start there? Because he needs to teach us things that go completely against everything else we've ever heard. Everything else we've ever witnessed. Everything else we've ever been taught. And sometimes the war in our mind full of logic and rationalization and emotion, it must choose to yield to a higher truth just because it's true. And Jesus needs us to understand that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So any thought leading us away from where whatever we just heard Him say can be labeled as a lie and dealt with appropriately because He's God. When you're confused or in a conflict that Jesus is t- with what Jesus is telling you is true, take your time. Stay calm. Read John 10, 37 and 38 very slowly. Taking it in. Understanding the significance. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, Though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. If you can get there, you're not far from Jesus. Then, though you may be uncomfortable with what he seems to be leading you to do or say or think, even if it means laying down something you've been carrying and trusting in for a very long time, time and there's a lot of bad teaching out there and there's a lot of false religions out there and there are a lot of people who are carrying around the baggage of everything they've been taught since they were little kids so when they hear something straight out of scripture sometimes it's hard for them to lay down what they already had what Jesus is exhorting us to do here is hey just get back to the the main point am I God or not what was I at least sent by God? Can we get there? Because God never contradicts himself. So if God sent me and what I'm saying contradicts something you already believe, you need to lay that down and walk away from it. Because it's dangerous on some level. You can have the courage to move forward on the path he set before you because at least you know one thing he is in the father and the father is in him and whatever he wants you to do is best for you and whatever he tells you is the truth that's a starting point that's something you can work with when you can get to the point where you where you can say this this sentence he is my shepherd and i will follow him then every time you reach a point where i don't know if i can follow him you come back to your statement he is my shepherd and i will follow him yeah but i don't that's so hard that's not what i learned that's not what i was taught but you are my shepherd and i will follow you 
but, but I don't see where the pastures are and where you're leading me. It seems scary and dangerous over there, but you are my shepherd and I will follow you. What of this reference to God's people being called gods? I kind of glossed over that one. We're all familiar with the, the word Elohim. That's the, 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 the name in plural form for God, whereby we understand our concept of the Trinity, three but one. One name, Elohim. One God, plural word. Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word God is Elohim. A masculine, plural form. But here's the actual definition of that word. Is it an official name of God used in Genesis 1-1 in the very beginning? Yes, it is. But it's also just a word with a definition. Here's what it means in the Hebrew, that word Elohim. God's in the ordinary sense, but specifically used of the supreme God. So yeah, it, it normally is speaking of the God. Occasionally applied by a way of deference to magistrates and sometimes as a superlative like something is great or something is angelic or something is mighty. It's a term that can be used descriptively that way. Did you know there were other ways to use that word? It's interesting. See, words mean stuff. All you got to do is go look it up. It's interesting. Here's an example of the more basic use of the word, one that isn't connected at all to the name of God. Not, not big G, God. In Exodus 22 uh, 7 and 8 it says if a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep and it is stolen out of the man's house if the thief is found he shall pay double if the thief is not found then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods the word judges in the Hebrew is Elohim the exact same Elohim as in the beginning God but it's just it's common use judges Magistrates, those in authority, those given authority. So what is Jesus getting at in our passage today? That men are big G gods? Called that by the Father? That's not the context of this passage at all. You'd have to read that verse by itself to get that. No. Of course not. God himself debunks that back in Isaiah. He says in Isaiah 43.10, Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. So if you use Scripture to interpret Scripture, you can't get sideways there. No, he's referencing the fact that it has been given to us by our Heavenly Father to be little g gods. Earthly Elohim, having the faculty and the calling to honestly judge matters presented to us. Reasoning. You know, we're created in the image of God. If He is the judge who can rule righteously, and we're in His image, then He's expecting that from us. Elohim, God's little g, magistrates, judges. That's what He's exhorting them to do in the matter before them now. In determining what to do with him and everything he said so far. Just look at the evidence, guys, and judge honestly. That's all he wants from them. 37, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Therefore, they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. They just can't get there. So sad. Then and now. Every time someone is repelled from the true Christ instead of drawn to him by the truth of the gospel, man, it just breaks my heart. Breaks my heart. 40, and he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true. And many believed in him there. See, some of them are starting to reason it out. Like, hey, we trusted John. He didn't even have signs and wonders. He just seemed to us to be from God. And he spoke of this guy, Jesus, as the, the one who would take away the sins of the world. And so they just put all 
their logic in a row and used it, and they got to Jesus that way. They believed in him. Here's the only other thing I'll point out, and then I'll let you go. He went away. Okay, we see that a lot. Jesus reaches a point where he knows the conversation is going no farther. Uh, he's planted all the seed he can. In that instance, it's now counterproductive to stay. And so he just goes away. He did that again here. And a bunch of people followed him. And a bunch of those people believed in him. Here's why that matters. In the context of this whole chapter, going back to the, to the beginning, talking about a shepherd, who a shepherd is, what a shepherd does, how they lead. This chapter has shown us those characteristics. How Jesus himself has shown us how his leadership style relates to that of a leader and guardian of sheep from that part of the world. Why do I say from that part of the world? Well, eastern shepherds are very different from western shepherds, shepherds generally speaking. Eastern shepherds, to this day, do it the way Jesus described for us. He speaks, they hear him, he walks away, and they follow him. That's how a shepherd led then. That's how Jesus leads now. Remember, like I said, the illustration of the sheepfold in the city where you've got all the flocks gathered together in one place. One shepherd walks up and calls out and only his sheep come out. And, and then he turns and walks away. He's not even looking back. He turns and walks away and they follow him. I don't know if they still do it. There's somebody used to do that in the Christmas parade here. They have a couple little baby sheep in the parade. And the guy would just walk. You think about all the distractions of a parade. All the noise, all the little kids hollering at them, throwing candy at them. You know what those sheep did? They just walked. They followed their shepherd. Never wandered off. He never got behind them and had to push them and drive them. No, when he walked away, they followed. That's Jesus' leadership style. Western shepherds tend to use a different method. And it's completely, a completely different mindset. They tend to drive flocks from behind, not lead them from the front. It's very aggressive and manipulative and a, a bit on the insecure side. Sounds like America, right? America. It seems to imply that these leaders wouldn't expect to be trusted wholeheartedly and followed unreservedly. Jesus is never aggressive or manipulative or insecure in the way he leads his sheep. Hey, don't make this mistake. Don't ever ask Jesus to drive you. It's against his nature. Who does Jesus drive? What example do we have of Jesus driving people? Those who take advantage of his sheep. Well, he'll drive wolves all day long. Saw him do it in the temple, right? flipped over some tables, stood there and made a whip and then ran those guys out of the place with it. If Jesus is driving you, you need to re-examine your situation. Because <laughs> that is not his leadership style. What, what's my point? Do you ever pray like this? And listen, I'm, I've done it. I'm over it. But I've done this thing. Lord Jesus... Make me do the right thing today. Now, you're giggling, but you've done it, haven't you? You know what we're saying when we do that? Jesus, I don't want to do the right thing today. Will you just make me? Make me treat people the way I should. Make me follow you the way I should. Make me act like you today. If he made us do the right things, there wouldn't be much value in it, would there? There certainly wouldn't be any glory for him in it. No, our Lord says, come to me and take my yoke upon you to find rest for your souls. Hey, you be proactive in seeking me out. And I'll take care of you. You be proactive in listening for my voice and following me. And I'll make sure you have everything you need. I'll make sure you are protected from wolves. I'll drive them out but I will not drive you. I'm asking you to trust me and follow me. No matter what. Make a choice that I am worth 
following, that I am trustworthy, that I have your best intentions at heart always, that by following me, you will find the sustenance that you need, the protection that you need, and the healing that you need. So as we begin Holy Week, Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus received honest, open, out in front of everybody worship, and it was glorious. On that day, as we're thinking about that, and that's leading us into an afterglow and a Wednesday meeting and watching the Passion of the Christ on Friday and the Easter egg hunt and Resurrection Sunday, this, this whole week. Use this as a springboard. Use this teaching as a springboard and the emotion of this week and what Jesus did for you as a springboard to make him your shepherd, to choose him as your leader without reserve without option, without worry, with full trust. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Let's do that. That's the plan for the week. Amen. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you so much for this wealth of knowledge that you give to us each and every week when we come together. And all we have to do is open it up and read it. Find out what the words mean, and the truth is right there. We will never look at you and say, just tell us plainly. Who are you? You have revealed that to us. And I thank you so much for that. Your grace and mercy abound. To, it, it abounded to them and it abounds to us here today. And I just thank you for that. I thank you for the redeemed. I thank you for the fact that those who are not yet yours have hope that they don't even know about. They are still breathing, which means they can still become your sheep. And I pray that for them today and this week. That in their quiet moments at home, if they are wrestling with anything from this message, with anything they've heard about you, I pray that you would lead them to truth. I pray that they would ask you for truth. Because I sense that you are always willing to answer honest questions about yourself. So get us to that place, that healthy place, where we can just look at you and say, I don't get it. Will you explain this to me? And Lord, just fill us with all the wisdom and knowledge that you have that we need. Draw us near to you, Lord, especially this week. When we're contemplating what you did to save us, draw us near to you. Let us experience you in a powerful way this week like we never have before. May you be at the forefront of our minds and on the tip of our tongue all week long. That people would know why there's hope in us. May you be glorified. It's in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Love you all.